right, well, welcome to this week's solo show, where if you can see me, I'm in a new environment for reasons that will become clear, but I just need to check in the chat. Can anyone hear me? Can anyone hear me? All right. The things I do. Oh, good. Everyone can hear. Yay. All right. So, uh, yeah, as you can plainly see, I'm not in my house. Uh, and, oh, my God, it was going to be so... I mean, we are going to be talking about Gnosticism and Archons and all the rest of it today, right? But uh, at last weekend or last Friday down here, um, the telecom informed us that they'll be working on upgrades of the towers where we live in the valley. And so we might have internet, might not have internet for a whole week. And I'm like, listen, I've only just begun this process of having Thursday evening come rain or shine uh, episodes. And I can't go like two weeks and then be like, sorry, the internet's down. So I'm up in Hobart, <laughs> in, which is my state capital, in an Airbnb. Uh, and just to make sure that we could actually get this show out, uh, if you're listening along later. And, uh, and yeah, and then there were some technical difficulties. I'm going to uh, Mercury Station blame, I guess. But technical difficulties, and I'm like, oh, come on, because apparently the internet is fine down in the farm. This was just like a precautionary move up. I have also been working on the foundations, uh, which starts in a couple of weeks. I'm going to mention that towards the end of the show. Uh, so this time around, I don't have my multiple screen set up, uh, which means when we do get to the screen share, again, if you're listening, these are just, <laughs> it's just another, you know, AI generated uh, presentation, really just so I can read along uh, with my notes for these kind of solo shows where there is actually content um, to go through. Uh, but if you're in the chat, I will, I don't have a screen to, to look at your commentary <laughs> as we're going through it. Uh, but what I might do, just so that it's less annoying for the people, which is most people, frankly, who are listening to this rather than watching it, uh, at the end of the presentation, uh, we might like do a little chat. I'll stay live. We might do a little chat uh, and, uh, and you know, play about in the chat room. And I'll just cut that out of the audio version so that people are like, ah, oh, come on, come on now. And that's fair. That's a very fair uh, exclamation were we not to do so. But yeah, so Gnosticism is a spell, is, an, is a notion that came to me at the, um, Astro Gnostic or Astro Gnosis conference in Mexico now last year, right? Less than a year ago, but last year. Uh, and so I wanted to have a play with that idea because for particularly quote unquote Western magic, and certainly right now, there's kind of like a, uh, how, do we, how do we square a Gnostic circle in an animist sense, right? Because there is something very profound to Gnosticism uh, but I don't think reality is a prison. And so it's like, what do I, <laughs> what, do, what do I do with that? I think this is a, I think this is a living cosmos that is made up of a community of beings. And yet there is something about, um, Gnosticism, right? So let me just jump down to old screen share McGee. No, I don't want that one. I want this one. Sorry, again, I, I don't have all my buttons and the rest of it. And I'm just going to jump tab. So everyone who's like in the chat, see you in 40 minutes. All right. Gnosticism is a spell. Now, I'm going to mention this later on in the presentation, but this idea is a modification of something I said a couple of years ago that made it onto T-shirts, which is optimism is a spell, right? Because there is something that uh, Miguel of Aeon Byte, if you're new watching this, I keep referencing Miguel, Good friend, host of Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio, the best Gnostic pod podcast there is, right? Um, and he uh, facilitated the conference last year. So we talk when we talk about this kind of stuff, we both rail against the idea that Gnosticism is automatically pessimist, or that it's or pessimism is contained within Gnosticism. Because as Miguel points out, and this is true, the the suspicion of the physical world, that kind of major Greek era, was well and truly in place by the time we got Gnosticism, right? So it inherited it. So we can't, they, it can sing Billy Joel's We Didn't Start the Fire uh, when it comes to that kind of suspicion. That being said, 
uh, it's not exactly happy, clappy, love and light, is it? So uh, Gnosticism is a spell is like a riff on optimism is a spell. So years ago, I wrote a post that, I, that still holds up today, uh, even before I would, I guess, dare I say, self-identify as an animist. Uh, Gnosticism is the map, animism is the territory, right? And so that's to say that uh, Gnosticism can give you a map of how power works, uh, certainly on this planet, uh, but probably other ones, in, a, uh, in the context of being in a living cosmos. But the thing is, it's kind of like what I just said, it's also more than that. Right, so there's a story, there's a um, prayer at the back of uh, Pieces of Eight from the Bruce Codex. And the reason it's in there was I was fucking around with different, I guess, kind of like early Christian, Gnostic. By the way, we're not going to get into what is Gnosticism. This, if this is your first um, podcast or video about Gnosticism, uh, <laughs> pause and, you know, go and ask chat GPT what Gnosticism is or something like that, right? So it's not going to be that. The, this is a little bit more polemical about how Gnosticism can be a spell. And it's based on this idea that sort of came to me at the conference. Uh, anyway, so I'm at this pub in London meeting my ex-boss, or soon to be ex-boss, because we were both conspiring to get out of the work that we were in. Uh, and I got there early, and I had like ordered a glass of wine, and I had a couple of sips of it. And I just, so we had this table, and there's no one around me. And so I just sort of started saying this prayer. And it was like coming up on, I guess, MDMA, but really fast, like this sort of crackling, ascending joy feeling. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> this is, uh, and, all, and like looking out over the pub as uh, after I'd done this, it was some kind of, I don't know, dimensional shift. You guys, you know what I mean, right? But it was like, wow, this is really potent. So when, so Gnosticism is a map, but it's more than that, right? There's stuff that still has juice that's in it uh, even now, right? So the map and territory thing is in play, but for this presentation or this discussion or this podcast, I want to kind of push on and through a little bit more than that, right? So the last time Miguel and I spoke about this on the show, because I had this thing, right? Uh, and I am more interested in, that's not right. I think universals, or near universals, because there are no actual universals, tell us something very important rather than particulars. And so in animistic, I use this term something like when we do um, comparison in a, I guess, post postmodern sense, where, um, you know, 19th century, early 20th century was all about making everything the same so that it can kind of ascend into this um, European superior culture mode. And then you get the sort of postmodernism where it's like nothing's the same as everything else, everything's contextual, and everyone's sort of separated into their little uh, bubbles. Both of them are idiotic, obviously. Um, so, how do we do comparison? And so, I have this take or premise that the more widespread something is, uh, and particularly with variations, so this is almost like a genetic frame the more there might be something to it, you know? So spirit world, universal, that kind of stuff. And what, what I asked Miguel last time I was on the show is, because it seems to me that Gnosticism is more particular than it is universal. This idea that the world is a prison created by like an idiot or evil God designed to trap you here and that things aren't as they seem uh, and, and you're basically being gaslit. <laughs> it, is a, it is a gaslit cosmos. That's quite unique. Now, the closest you can get to it, and, and sort of for similar, I guess, almost political reasons, you have the idea that the cosmos is an illusion, like samsara or whatever, which I also think is um, wrong, but also I don't think it's translated quite correctly out of where that came from. So that's not a burn on all of South Asia, right? Uh, and I asked Miguel, like, is the, is the Gnostic impulse universal? Like, can we, does it look like things we find anywhere else? Or is it specific? Like, is it specific to that little corner of the world, the Eastern Mediterranean in the century before Christ and well, 80 years before Christ and a couple of centuries after, right? And he said, no, it's particular. I'm like, damn it. <laughs> 
<laughs> how do I how do I resolve that then? Because there's something in it, and I again, this is my take that uh, typically I find something in universals or near universals, not in specifics. That that's kind of like the um, the environmental differences on on a universal. And I'm like, what is? But but there's something to it. It's like because otherwise, what you have with these situations, we get to it at the end, is so you're telling me, not Miguel or anyone, but hypothetically in this conversation, you're telling me that the Gnostics of all the people on planet Earth, everywhere and every when, got it right, which is the universe is a prison run by an idiot God, uh, and our job is to sort of wake up out of it. And then everyone else got it wrong. It's, uh, I don't think that's, that doesn't seem correct to me, right? So, but then how do we how do we look at the fact that it still has some potency and some juice to it? So that hence this presentation. And especially now, <laughs> because as Miguel would say, these are Gnostic times. So as I was putting this presentation together yesterday up here in this Airbnb, uh, I kind of because I'd been looking at different Gnostic videos on YouTube, the um, this James Lindsay, he's that ex, I think he's ex Google, that guy who went from, oh, I don't like um, woke HR policy at Google to I've made a very successful business being transphobic and ghastly. So I'm not going to share the video, but he literally yesterday did a video. There's this take on, I guess, the internet, right? That Marxism is actually a form of Gnosticism uh, and thus wokeism, whatever that is, is also a form of Gnosticism. And I want to talk about this because when we're talking about these being Gnostic times, here's where some of the medicine kind of happens, right? So Dr. Farrell, who I have much more time for than James Lindsay, he says the same thing. He's like, he sees these as Gnostic times rather than say archonic times, but he doesn't like Gnosticism. <laughs> There's a crucial difference here, right? So being of an orthodox persuasion, and I say this a lot, but it's important if you haven't heard it before, when it comes to orthodoxy, or what is now called orthodox Christianity, it certainly wasn't in the second century or third, um, is Batman to Gnosticism's Joker, right? Like, so orthodoxy is defined, Batman has a bunch of other villains. Batman has the Penguin and all the rest and Catwoman and what have you. But he was made by the Joker. He was made by that antagonism. That's like the ultimate, when I say ultimate enemy, it's the defining enemy that I am not that. So the last people you want to ask about Gnosticism uh, are the Orthodox, and to some extent vice versa, although not really, right? So he's coming at it from an uh, anti-Gnostic perspective from the beginning. But his point is that uh, why he calls, I guess, this um, Gramscian, Marxist, woke, whatever thing Gnostic, is because of its assault on fixity, on language. Uh, and so, I mean, you know, obviously the gender stuff uh, is one of them, but, and, you know, having people, having <laughs> people say I'm not a biologist, all, all that kind of thing is like, in his head, this is a wrecking of the, the, the fixed things of reality, like a destruction, right, uh, of things that exist. But so I cannot get anyone, but see, that's not, Gnostic in the sense that the Gnostics aren't doing that. I cannot get anyone to explain to me, and James Lindsay in the New Discourses video, which I'm not going to link, but you can find it. It's annoying. Um, I can't get anyone to explain to me. The Gnostics aren't trying to destroy reality, right? They're trying to leave it. So this idea of like wrecking or, or changing reality, that's actually the sin of the demiurge. So when Dr. Farrell or James Lindsay or whoever says like uh, Marxists are just Gnostics because they're trying to like um, transform reality into something better. And I'm like, no, 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 that's literally the demiurge. I can't, this is driving me fucking nuts. And this is the other half of the presentation, which is the Gnostics want to get out of here, right? The demiurge was like, I can make this better. I can make this into a paradise. And so the bad guys, quote unquote, the demiurge and the archons are the ones, uh, let's say, changing reality by changing the the language, by like using the spell of gaslighting to do it. And it's it's driving me, like this sort of stuff is frustrating anyway, 
particularly James Lindsay, but it's driving me fucking nuts. They're all confidently like the, the one thing they know less about than Marxism turns out to be Gnosticism. And they're saying not Gnostics are Marxists. No, Marxists are Gnostics. Driving me nuts. <laughs> all right. Now, why I'm mentioning this is you can. So how does that work? Like, because I, I get what they're saying. I mean, I don't, certainly not James Lindsay, but I, I get what they're saying, which is that we are in a moment where um, we are being gaslit into a false reality. So it's, but how does it work for both of us? How does, this is a metaphor, and this is very unique for metaphors that will work in, in multiple directions. Gnosticism will work in multiple directions. So I know what they mean when they say, they're just wrong, but I know what they mean when they say that the Marxists are Gnostic. Because I look at what's going on in the world, I look at, you know, um, the <laughs> the White House press secretary's pronouncements or the rest of it as like, because they are satanically false in the sense that they are the complete opposite of what's actually happening, right? And I look at it and go, yeah, like we're both saying we live in Gnostic times. I just think it's better to say we're iconic times. I don't think, I don't think Biden is a Gnostic, right? Um, as an example, I don't think you could say Mitch McConnell, it's the same story. I don't think they're Gnostics, right? Uh, but we are in Gnostic times. So there's something we come back to. Here is this metaphor. And for me, as you know, metaphors are spells that will work even in the hands of an idiot like James Lindsay, even though it's like, and, and also still work in the opposite of the way it was intended. So that's a spell that is kind of like a reversal already or intimately. That's weird. That is a weird thing that we should look at. So here's this powerful spell, right? So, um, so potent that it can be used wrongly. And I still understand, even though I disagree with it, what they mean, right? So there's a technology here, there's like, you know, magical sense that I think is sort of really real because both sides get, as I said before, a map of how power works, right? Uh, and an understanding of you, and this is the other crucial bit, an understanding that there is a part of you that is undiminished and unblemished by operating in this, you know, uh, escalating nightmare uh, situation, right? So, and I think about, <clears throat> the, obviously, because I think about Tolkien a lot, uh, is there something Gnost-ish, right? Because people, he's, he was Catholic as the day is long, right? But there's been a bunch of attempts to try to make it sort of Gnostic because there is like a creation, sub-creation thing. Like he's so close, but it's Gnostic. Uh, and, and there is something about this spell, this metaphor, that actually makes it easier to live here, right? So one of the things that uh, Tolkien found medicine in from a Catholic perspective is that this is a fallen world. Right. Obviously, he lost all his friends in, in World War One. And so like a, a, a terrible childhood. Father died early. Mother died young. Really only got an education because of a priest who took an interest in him. And, and I hope to God it was a not a usual priestly interest. But who knows? He certainly wouldn't have spoken about it. They were probably not. But, you know, uh, so he, he kind of had. He didn't have the best life, didn't have the worst, but didn't have the best life. And one of the things that helped him, although he obviously loved creation, loved trees and the rest of it, was the awareness that this was a fallen world. And so in the, in the kind of overall legendarium, if not in Lord of the Rings, there's this idea of um, Middle Earth being Morgoth's ring. So uh, Morgoth being the Valar that initially Sauron worked for. If you're unaware of this, I don't know how you've managed to find my channel, but, <laughs> but Sauron is like the lieutenant of the, the main bad guy from the Silmarillion. And whereas Sauron put all his energy into the one ring as an effort to kind of control the other ring owners and, and perfect the world, Morgoth put his malice and darkness into creation, into Middle Earth, the, the physical creation itself, because he wanted to participate in creation and he did so with malice. But one of the reasons why he was defeated was whereas Sauron put all his energy into the ring and was thus weakened, Morgoth put even more energy into his quote unquote ring, which is Middle Earth. So there's this idea, um, there's a peculiar medicine in this, right? Where you don't have to go full Gnostic, but you actually can have 
uh, malicious attempts at control being part of a cosmology, right? So I'm calling that Nost-ish. Uh, anyway, so like I said, coming back to where this began, optimism is a spell. Uh, how can optimism be a spell and Gnosticism be a spell, especially if Gnosticism is kind of like, quote unquote, pessimistic? And uh, again, the presentation, I think that's where we're at. The Miguel's presentation specifically, at Astro Gnosis, had the stuff I was looking for. And I was literally like furiously making notes in the conference room in Playa del Carmen, thinking like, oh, I'll get this out next week when I get to Merida. And uh, here we are, nine months later. Anyway, you know, um, a wizard is never late. We were just talking about Tolkien. But let me talk about some of the stuff that Miguel mentioned and how I think this works for me, right? So second century, there is a, a now called Gnostic cult, the Nasenes, or the um, Naseni, uh, Nasenoi, very likely to come from the Hebrew word, well, best guess, rather than very likely, is it comes from the Hebrew word for serpent, right? And serpent being a symbol of spiritual wisdom and the path to Gnosis, this cult was founded by a woman, uh, Mariamne, um, who is a disciple of James the Just. So according to the Nasenes, the serpent in the gut, this is all written by ChatGPT, <laughs> Not the bullet points, I did some work. Uh, according to the Nassines, the serpent in the Garden of Eden was actually a messenger of the true God who brought knowledge to Adam and Eve and helped one uh, help them see the spiritual world beyond the material one. The Nassines also had a unique interpretation of Jesus Christ, which they saw as a manifestation of the eternal God rather than a human being. They believed that Jesus was a revealer of Gnosis who taught the secrets of the spiritual world to his disciples. Okay, so we have the serpent as and there is some indication again we we've kind of got like one hymn fragment that is specifically not seen right but there's some indication that the serpent is also somehow jesus because jesus wasn't a man it was it is a god um, and and some sort of eternal being so they are what we now call mythicists in their own way uh, and so goodness a lot has happened to the serpent uh, for it to take its uh, negative, take on the negative connotations that it got in the subsequent 1800 years. Now, come back to that. Let me give you another one, which is even more kind of metal. The Periatics, uh, Hippolytus literally calls them dragon riders in Refutation of All Heresies. And uh, again, this is, I hadn't, and I, it's not exactly on my nightstand, but I had read Refu Refutation of All Heresies, but this is, there are so many heresies <laughs> that I forgot this one. And Miguel reminded me of it at the conference, right? The gods of the ancient world were once upright in the sense that um, they were good. So the, the cosmos was sort of fundamentally good, uh, but became corrupt and rebelled against the perfect good, like the Pleroma, the God above God, if you will, right? Uh, and they were trying to find divine solutions to liberate all beings. So they're still psychically and emotionally invested in the cosmos, right? And um, Jesus, here's another one. Jesus was the serpent in the Garden of Eden, and uh, that was associated with Draco, the asterism. And they had Draco tattoos, right? So you have actual dragon riders, and you have effectively serpent worshippers. Uh, and I'm thinking, okay, cool. Let's, um, how do we do this then? Because what I was thinking as Miguel was giving this presentation is, for 100,000, no, let's do it exactly, 98,000 years, so from 100,000 BC, give or take, this is some stuff from Starships, right, to um, 0 AD. The snake is, I don't know, I don't want to say a good guy, uh, but a profound, powerful, transformative teacher of mankind and mother. Um, 100,000 years uh, in Southern Africa, the earliest kind of like quote unquote archeological evidence for ritual is a giant snake, of course, rainbow serpent. Um, you look at the um, Kundalini and Nagas and all this kind of stuff that we now have in what we call Hinduism, but are plainly uh, come from an earlier layer, right? 98,000 years. And I, I think of course of like ayahuasca because I was off to do ayahuasca once I was down in Mexico a month or so later. So we have the, a better for my mind story of the snake for 98,000 years. And then it hits a particular political moment. Because the thing about Gnosticism that I think makes it specific to a place time is, and why it's useful now, is it emerged in an imperial tyranny 
and a dissatisfaction with the betrayal of cultural elites, right? So the complicity of um, the, the Jewish rabbinical and just cultural elites with the Roman Empire sounds a little bit like the last few years, if you ask me, right? Like the, the betrayal um, from people that we expected, not like cultural icons and, you know, punk magicians, punk musicians and all the rest of it, right? But we're in this profound, there's a profound moment of betrayal and that the, the premises of how reality works proving to be false and um, politically motivated, right? So these beings, and it's not just the snake, what I was thinking about is the tree, and I'll get to that in a minute. 98,000 years, but let's say a couple of hundred thousand years of being what I assume they are, which is these powerful teachers and medicine healers, and, and you can call them archetypes, spirit beings, whatever you want, right? I'm just going to go with archetypes for now to keep it more ecumenical. They hit this moment where they get um, slandered, I guess, particularly in the case of the snake. But it's more than that, right? So these beings rearrange to continue delivering medicine. So the the tree of life, consider what that actually is, right? So that's a plant teacher in the actual Amazonian sense. Here is a plant that you ingest to get wisdom. So again, snake, plant teacher, the, these ideas hit a moment where because of what's going on, uh, they get uh, slandered along with, and rightly so, the sort of like political, cultural and religious elite of the time. So what's the option? Walk away? Because um, they're not those things, right? There is the opportunity to reorganize those beings, though for those beings to re reorganize so that they are in fact still available. Like they are still in our psyche in order to do so. The best case of that is the plant teacher, the serpent. And remember there are kind of like meandering heresies in and out of it. But if you widen it out from serpent to that kind of dare I say reptile teacher being, right? You have um, the, the stories of saints being awash with dragons. And again, this is plainly, um, in some of them, like the St. Martha one, it's almost like there's, dare I say, more sympathy for the dragon. It's when the dragon shows up in saintly mythology, it's, everyone's kind of more interested in the bad guy. <laughs> and it's not necessarily bad as much as it is existing, right? But these archetypes are still there. And so that's kind of how I'm like, okay, cool. How do I, in, how do I fit Gnosticism into, as a spell, into a, the, this much wider landscape of an animist cosmos, right? And it is a spell of exit. Uh, and it is, a, it is a spell of seeing tyranny and exit. Uh, and for that to be the case, particularly in that time, particularly in that time of oppression and, uh, uh, and betrayal and, and so on, these forms rearranged so that they can actually deliver the medicine that was needed for that moment in time, right? So it's Gnosticism is a, dare I say, a shamanic spell, a shamanic spell of healing that works in this kind of uh, cosmos setting, right? Because Again, I'm stuck with like, how do the, and, and one day, this is actually one of the, for people who don't know, the premium members vote on courses. And it's always been in the top 10. One day, this isn't the Gnosticism course, but one day we will actually get to it. And I hope we do <laughs> because there is some stuff in there. And there's some stuff that I want to put in the hands of magicians who are much more likely to be on the living cosmos animus side of things. And Because I do understand why people dismiss it either from like, hey, it's still too churchy for me, or um, I don't think the cosmos is some sort of prison created by an idiot god, which, you know, in both cases, valid, <laughs> valid objections, but there's stuff in there for you, right? Uh, and so this is how I do a shamanic squaring of the Gnostic circle, which is when you credit these beings with agency, uh, they can do stuff like this. And it's sort of how I, I allow both to be alive in my head. So we come to is this is happening again. And uh, again, from Miguel's presentation, he mentions April to Connick's the Gnostic New Age, right? And the, the basic thesis is that the, the modern interest in Gnosticism actually goes back to when it sort of started documents like the Bruce, Bruce Codex. That was the 
That was the 18th century. Um, uh, it's not a new phenomenon. It actually, that interest emerged with the arrival of these texts with antiquarians into places like London and Berlin uh, and so on. And um, these Gnostic themes have been incorporated into the New Age movement, which emerged in, the, well, this is late 20th century. Let's go mid to late 20th century, right? And she argues that the New Age movement uh, with its focus on personal spiritual growth and the search for higher knowledge has been heavily influenced by Gnostic ideas, right? That's all well and good. Uh, she also examines the ways in which the texts found at Nag Hammadi in 1945 are used by modern Gnostics in New Ages and how they've been interpreted and reinterpreted to fit with contemporary spiritual beliefs. So there's the obvious, um, there's like a context question there, but, and that's true, absolutely that's true, certainly if you're going to be doing academic work, but they are also, what's so fascinating about the Gnostic texts that we do have is that plainly they are only part of a ceremony. So one of my, uh, it, it, when we were learning script writing, and particularly for plays, but, but for cinema as well, when we were learning script writing, my teacher said that um, th there's nothing sacred about the script. This is like, this is notes to give to the director. Um, it, is, it is a partial contribution to the real thing, that ha which is all true. If you know your theater, that's like, you know, don't, don't diverge from fucking Brecht because you feel like it, right? There are certain expectations that people want, but uh, that's true. And these texts are sort of like that, which funnily enough is as far as we can tell its contents. But also there's something to that, particularly the magic of that moment, that mid 20th century moment where they've arrived at a time in history, they've returned at a time in history to do that. And so this was the sort of second shoe to land to, to square that, to shamanically square the Gnostic circle for me, which is, is this happening again? Because we certainly are living in Gnostic times in the, in the literal sense of being um, gaslit by the powers of the earth. Uh, it's something Alberto Violdo talks about it. The Laika um, were like the um, spiritual masters it was a word for spiritual masters in like an Incan context, right? So they were the philosopher priests. Uh, and at, once the Spanish arrived and it became clear that uh, the jig was up for the Incan empire, they, in, according to um, like Curandero folklore, uh, they concealed their highest teachings from the Spanish in the future, right? So there's a playing with time aspect of, okay, this is where we have a few centuries of darkness coming up, right? Let's put this further up the timeline so that we can get access to it again, right? And it's sort of, when you think about that and you think about the arrival of the Nag Hammadi in that immediate post-war era of everything else, uh, you know, UFOs, all the rest of it, you're like, well, I'm not saying the Leica did that. That's, it's more the Leica, uh, an example of when you deal with these kind of energies and beings, you are dealing with a non-human understanding of time, right? And so again, I come back to like, this is some kind of spell, and that's quite a good one, right? Uh, the Nag Hammadi, the, the flow on effect of that discovery has barely begun, and it's 80 years ago, has barely begun 70, let's go with 70, uh, to be felt. Uh, it's like, is something like this happening again? This is coming back to making it alive, putting agency in it so that we don't get stuck into the binary, right? But true things behave like this, right? It's what teaching looks like. And these sort of beings or archetypes are polyvalent, you know? Okay. And this got me thinking, actually, just yesterday, putting the slides together, when I had John Michael Greer on the show the other week. Uh, and it's not that he believes this, but it was in the book which is specifically modeled on like a late 19th century, early 20th century esoteric program. Uh, and it annoyed me, not the book, <laughs> this part, which is um, he writes because he's writing the theme of a late 19th century, early 20th century framework that animals are lesser than humans and, animal, and plants are lesser than animals and rocks are lesser than plants and everything's kind of like evolving up to and through humankind into something else. Uh, 
which I don't think is true. I think that first of all, that's just the impact of uh, Darwin uh, at the time on it. But it's an inversion of basically everywhere else in the world where these beings that came before us. So again, in the Amazon, why plants are considered the teachers of this planet are because they've been here the longest. They have the most experience. Uh, and again, you think of ancestral and totemic beings around the world as um, wisdom keepers and protectors of, of tribes and country and landscapes and so on. I think that's inverted in many respects, right? But coming back to that idea that um, if these beings still have the love and desire to um, engage, relate, and teach, then if this is the best we have in terms of a framework of reality at the time, then it's going to work. Do you know what I mean? They'll be like, okay, cool. In the same way, if a child mispronounces your name, you know, you push her on the ground. No, you don't. Like you get what you get. What's happening? You kind of try to meet people where they're at. And so, the the idea of Gnosticism as a spell for me has uses because uh, we're going to be doing a lot of work. Not a lot, but um, the adequate amount of work on the elementals and and plant spirits and 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 stone spirits and all that kind of stuff in the foundation. So this is in my head, and I'm kind of. I, I'm putting this slide in here so I can point to this uh, podcast and this presentation afterwards to go, okay, cool. So if we credit agency to these beings, we have a new way of, we don't have to go dismiss or keep when it comes to, um, and it's not like there isn't that dualist pessimist stuff in some of the Gnostic texts. Like, so we don't have to go dismiss or keep we have a way of going, okay, right. So these beings were communicating with seekers at the time in a way that was necessary and worked. Do you know what I mean? And this is crucial. This is crucial like ancestors of practice work because, and however controversial, no longer controversial now, but even like most of the, as far as we can tell, most of the ritual components of a Sabbath come from the Gnostics right? So um, the full moon gatherings of 13, all this kind of stuff, um, the boga mills, all these kind of early heresies feed into the Inquisition's creation of what we understand as witchcraft, right? And that's a very specific thing to say, <laughs> but that's, this is, um, this is ancestral lineage work for Western magic, um, one way or the other, squaring with Gnostics. And also if you've kind of slept on it, uh, there's some really powerful stuff in there. And, and my what I've been looking for is a way that mean I don't have to go chaos magic on it, which is like, okay, today I'm a Gnostic and tomorrow I go back to being, I guess, an animist or self-identified animist, right? So, which you can still do if that's gonna work better for you, fucking go for it, whatever. But I, I need them to, I need them to live in the same house <laughs> all the time. <laughs> and this is my, maybe it's useful to you. Hopefully it is. This is how I want to do that, right? I want to kind of think of it as a spell that still works and still works because the conditions, like we all still need a map of power and how power works, right? So, but it's, it's a spell contained, I guess, like all spells in like a living cosmos situation, right? So yeah, that's it. So summing up, Gnosticism is a spell made of vastly ancient animist ingredients. Uh, and the spell is ever the same. Like I said, it is a map of what's going on and a point to the exit, right? Uh, and that, in their case, it's like leaving the planet. And that could still be it for you. But we actually have built, and ah, oh, funny, this is the other reason I want to say this. Um, the James Lindsay stuff is completely wrong, but the notion of like a Christian apotheosis is actually there in a lot of um, radical political, at least European political thought, right? So, and I think particularly with anarchism, because you kind of have two ways of that working where it's the, um, destroy and burn down the state, or there's the intellectual anarchism, right? Which is the um, opting out of power, like stepping out of it 
um, wherever possible. Firstly, and most essentially, and always like in your mind and attitude, but also wherever possible in your behaviors, right? That's Gnostic as fuck. <laughs> That's, uh, and the only place that got that, and this is kind of, this is not, again, they're not correct, but it is because everything is kind of downstream. A lot of that European radical political thought is indeed downstream from a Christian and sometimes Gnostic trajectory, right? And that doesn't mean it's bad, which is the departure from someone like James Lindsay, right? Uh, the, the Gnostic impulse of, of how to live on the earth and the kind of like intellectual um, anarchist one are similar and they are uh, available to similar critiques. It doesn't mean therefore they're, they're good. Um, there's a lot of good in them, but they're still available to critiques, right? So that's kind of what I meant. The spell is ever the same with apotheosis, right? And to accomplish this in a time of Roman oppression and Egyptian experimentation, which I didn't talk much about, but obviously that's the other factor, uh, the spell kept the same ingredients, but rearranged their ratio and sequence, right? So yeah, that was my, that's my presentation on, uh, <laughs> on how Gnosticism is a spell. And I did just want to mention for people who are listening along, we have a higher soup meetup in Wellington in New Zealand on February the 11th, because, you know, I might as well throw my hat in to be prime minister uh, now that Jacinta's fully gone. But uh, no, seriously, we had a higher soup meetup in Austin at the end of June, and that was really, really fun. And so I'm gonna be there on family business rather than necessarily work stuff. Uh, and if people are around, it's not members only, it's open invite. The link is in the show notes. Uh, and you don't like just RSVP so I know how many people are coming, if it's like three <laughs> or if it's 20, right? But yep, that's February the 11th. And the other thing is the foundations, uh, which I mentioned before, gonna start in about, I would say 10 days. But that's the presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing once my mouse wakes back up and jump back into the other tab and say my adieus to the audio folks. All right. Uh, yeah, that's the show. That's everything that I wanted to uh, speak to you about uh, on Gnosticism is a Spell. Let me know what you think. Uh, I'm really vibing on this format uh, of uh, having solo shows that allow me to riff on recent guests and recent things, right? Like we got to talk about John Michael Greer and so on. So uh, it's funny because they're fortnightly, like this stuff from the Harmony Cronin uh, conversation that I will probably get to in the next one. But I'm really, I'm really liking this sort of more adaptable way of doing things. So yeah, um, thank you very much. And I will see the audio guys in the next one. But for the people watching on video, all right, I'm going to jump into the chat. One of these days you're gonna catch a live from the beginning. I mean, I put it up, it's gonna be the same time every week, uh, well, every fortnight for the lives, but the other ones are gonna come out at the same time. So it kind of embeds in your head. Like I said before, years ago, Podcast Thursday was where Rune Soup started. So I wanna keep, I wanna keep doing, uh, I wanna keep doing that. Um. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna scroll up. Ah, see, I got to get back to, um, I got to get back to multi-screens because this always looks like a fun conversation. Yeah. Oh, simulation stuff. Yeah, I didn't make it into this presentation. Yeah, so House of the Dragon, right? Ah. This almost went in this um, presentation, but I had to get, I didn't want to get lost in the dragon bit. Like I almost cut the periatics and said, I want to do a dragon one separately. And I still might, because the other thing I did cut was last year on, or for St. George's Day, um, Paul Kingsnorth in his uh, Substack kind of wrote about obviously St. George and the dragon, right? And he's become, I don't begrudge anyone their spiritual journey, right? And he's gone from, you know, um, panicked uh, 
climate alarmism type stuff for much of his career to this kind of orthodox Christian, right? Um, and people are describing that as like a fascist turn or something. It's not for a start. And if you can't see the inherent conservatism in particularly that sort of panicked environmentalism where everything must stay the same as it was in the past, where everything was better. That's literally conservatism, right? So it's not that big of a jump. I don't understand why people are surprised that it happened. Anyway, I did expect better of a former environmentalist. I did expect better treatment of the dragon <laughs> from a former environmentalist. And I kind of wanted to respond to that um, uh, because it annoyed me and I'm, def I'm a defender of dragons, why not? And then I got thinking House of the Dragon, which I honestly enjoyed uh, better than uh, Game of Thrones. Uh, not that Game of Thrones was bad, but I just fucking loved House of the Dragon. It was exactly like hook it to my veins. It was exactly what I needed last year. And so I thought there's this whole, so we've got periodics and we've got defending the dragon against St. George sort of uh, and House of the Dragon. There is something, uh, there's something in there, right? And maybe there's just a blog post, but I almost put that in this, but it was too much to, and we would have got lost off this idea that I wanted to stay with, which is narcissism is a spell and it's a, um, it's a necessary for the time and maybe now rearrangement of existing um, uh, beings, right? Because the universe is an arrangement of beings. So that's the arrangement that gave us narcissism, you know? All right, yeah. Oh yeah, Corbin, no, there's more dragon to come. I could talk about dragons all day. <laughs> yeah. So Uncle Salty, the last time I listened to John Lamb Lash was years ago on High Side Chats where he got increasingly and weirdly anti-Semitic. So he's probably not gonna be on the show ever. All right. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, um, I got to do an extra dragon rant <laughs> towards the end there. Ah, anyway, um, I need to check out of this Airbnb. But um, thanks, everyone who was in the chat. And yeah. Uh, I, next one is a normal episode, so we got the rhythm right. Um, next one's a guest episode, and then a the week after that is a solo show, then another guest, and then a surprise solo show. Well, not really. Um, that solo show might have a surprise guest is the right way to say it, and that's not cheating. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, thanks very much in the chat. I am going to end the broadcast, and uh, and yeah. See you in the next one.